spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. Crash landed. From comics to video games. From the cinematic universe to television. Earth. Connecting you to the biggest stars in the industry. Something out there had discovered us. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. You might say bad boys for life, but it looks like it's the ladies' turn. It's episode 335 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham, and if you're watching Fox, you know that LA's Finest has premiered, broadcast premiere, actually, with Jessica Alba, Gabrielle Union. Yes, it is a bad boys spinoff series. And if you want to learn more about it this week, I've actually got the creators and executive producers and writers of the show. It's Brandon Margolis and Brandon Sonier are going to join me this week. We'll break down everything that happened in episode one, get you ready for episode two, which is going to be on Monday at eight o'clock on Fox. You can catch up right now on the Fox Now app if you want to on episode one. So can't wait to dive into that with them. Also coming up this week, a lot of big nerd news, especially when it comes to the Arrowverse, some Marvel stuff. Yes, more shifting release dates. We'll talk about that and some great new series and maybe even a movie or two that are debuting this week that I'm going to tell you about. Let's start things off, though, with my spoiler-free review of Utopia from Amazon. We'll do that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is John Sipos from Krypton, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. It's time to save the world once again. Amazon's brand-new series, Utopia, is finally streaming, and I'm going to—I was debating because, you know, the show is out— I could easily do, you know, a little bit of spoilery stuff, but I think I got to do this one spoiler free because literally all the spoilers that I could tell you that mean anything are are kind of like they're a big deal. And I don't like to, you know, reveal big deal type stuff. So I will, you know, maybe some character details I can give you. But other than that, I think I'm going to go spoiler free, even though the series is out because it literally just came out. I don't want to drop too many uh, spoilers. So basically the story follows Becky Ian Wilson and Samantha, their friends that met online, huge fans of an underground graphic novel series. They can kind of predict the end of the world, you know, like the flus and, and, pa- and pandemic type stuff. You know, hello, kind of the world we're living in now, it seems like. And here's the deal. A mysterious second volume of this graphic novel series unearths itself. And basically fans scramble to get their hands on this thing. This, this show will make you miss cons in the bit very beginning because there is like a convention that happens in the beginning of the series. And the fact that we haven't had any cons this year, it's going to make you miss cons. I'm just going to just put that out there right now. But basically it turns out that there's kind of much more to it than that. And there's a secret organization that's going to stop at nothing to not only get utopia, but kill anyone that's actually seen it. And what's also interesting is in this group of friends between Becky E. and Wilson and Samantha, there's also Grant. Now, Grant might be the most mysterious of all because he's got a big secret of his own. And that's the fact that he's just a kid and they don't know it. You know, he's kind of, you know, online you can be whoever you want kind of thing. Right. And this is on display in this series because Grant kind of portrays himself as this rich, high roller guy. And they don't know he's just a kid. But he plays a very big part, especially in the early going of this series. Now I, there's just a couple of other characters to point out here. You've got John Cusack who doesn't really do TV, but does a great job in this series. he plays the head of a drug company. That's kind of a, I mean, kind of a drug company that could be tied to a deadly disease that's going on right now. And you've got rain Wilson who plays a scientist basically he's in a dead end job and they're treating him like garbage, but he could actually be one of the keys to saving the, saving the world. So that much I can tell you. Beyond that, I'm not going to really be able to give you much detailed information on spoilers. What I can tell you is what I thought about what I saw in this series. And, and that is that there are a lot of moments that you think you know what's going on, you think you've got to figure it out, and y- you realize really quickly that you don't. There's a lot of surprising moments, especially in the early going of this series, that I did not see coming. And some of them that you will. And I got to tell you, there's a part in episode two that's really hard to watch. I mean, it is extreme 
type stuff. So this is not a show that is for the faint of heart. I could tell you that right now. There, there's some, there's some uncomfortable stuff that you're definitely going to be seeing in this series. So I'm just going to put that out there right now. But once you, once the mystery of utopia in this story sorts to kind of unravel itself, it, it's very, very interesting. And certain things that you find out, especially in the early going about the story, make you go, huh? Because you've got a group of fans who believe, you know, it's just a comic. Then you've got another group of fans that thinks that everything that's happening in utopia is real or it points to real world stuff. That is our group that I was telling you about. They think there's real world implications to this and they actually want to save the world before they even know any of the stuff that's going on before any of this even happens. They, they want to save the world. That is one of their objectives. So that was a very, very interesting part in this whole thing. And they are by all intents and purposes, believers, even when people kind of, poke fun at them for that. So it's a very intriguing premise in this. But I will say one thing that kind of held me back in this, and this is not really, I will point out the fact that this is not a fair criticism on my part, okay? But hear me out on this. You know, we're getting, we get so bogged down so much day to day right now in talk about a pandemic and all of the things that come along with that. And this series dives head first into a pandemic of its own that's going on on the show. So if you're really bogged down in seeing stuff about a pandemic and hearing about that stuff, then this series is something that's really going to go heavy into that. And I think it's holding me back from liking the series as much as I should. Under normal circumstances, I, I think I'd be all over this. But for some reason, I just find myself going... Uh, I don't know. And I think that that's part of it. And that's not fair. And if you if you don't mind that and you kind of are on the opposite end of the spectrum and you you want some sort of escapism in this, but sort of, you know, nudged right up against the against the box of it, then that's what this series will give you. You know, there, there was a reason that Outbreak was so popular on Netflix when the pandemic first started. It seemed like everybody wanted to dive in and wanted to, to, to experience more for some reason. But now we're, we've kind of been dealing with this for six months plus, and now we've got a series that has an, yet another pandemic, albeit a different one. I mean, it affects different people in different ways, obviously, and, and it affects younger population too, more more so, I will say that. And that, so so it's different, but it's the the idea of the pandemic is still the same. But the fact that it's based on this comic and the comic predicting these things, that to me is the interesting aspect of this story. So don't get me wrong. It's not all about the pandemic. There's a nice mystery tucked into this as well. And there's some good character driven stuff that is a part of the series. It's a good show, but it's a, it's, it's not the fault of its own that, that it just happens to contain a subject matter that we've been dealing with day in and day out that we just might not really need Right now, and again, that's totally unfair because it's a great show that is actually, there's a lot of great acting performances in there as well. As a matter of fact, fans of Gotham will recognize Corey Michael Smith, our very own Ed Nigma, was in the story. He actually plays, uh, he actually plays John Cusack's son, oldest son, in this series. And he does a great job, and there's just something about that character that you feel like, you feel like this guy's going to be important at some point. In this series, and John Cusack's character is haunting in a way that I can't really describe Dr. Kevin Christie until you see him on the screen. It's super, super just you get this weird vibe from him is the best way that I can possibly put it. You get weird vibes from actually a couple of characters in this series. And then you even even in the quote unquote good guys, you wonder, okay, well, who's really in the right and who really wants to do the right thing? This is a show that also keeps you guessing. There are a ton of great things about this show, but if you're pandemic out, whether it be in real life or in entertainment, then this might be something that you might want to save. But I'm saying just watch this show, especially give the first episode or two a chance to see if you like where it's going. I wouldn't say don't watch this if you're bogged down on the pandemic. I'm just saying that you're going to get a lot of heavy stuff into the pandemic. There's other stuff as well. And there's, again, a nice mystery involved here. But the pandemic is either the best timing for this show to come out 
or the worst timing for this show to come out. And I'll leave you to be the judge of that. But overall, I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens in the series. There's a lot of stuff, like I said, that you won't see coming. Some some stuff that you think you see coming and you don't. And there's just there are a lot of likable characters in this as well. Like Desmond Borges as Wilson Wilson, the, one of my favorite characters on the show for sure. And then you've got Becky, who's kind of the innocent one. You've got Ian, who he has some ups and downs. Let's just put it that way. And there's just something about Grant, too. Like, he's a survivor. That kid is definitely a survivor. So, a lot going on with Utopia. I dig it. I just, again, the whole pandemic thing, it's either the best or worst timing ever. And and I'm not sure which right now. But go check out Utopia on Amazon Prime Video, now streaming for Season 1. Eight episodes. It's very, very bingeable. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of Amazon's Utopia. Up next, going to dive into the world of L.A.'s finest with the creators and executive producers and writers and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's the Brandons up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hey, this is Lou Diamond Phillips from Fox's Prodigal Son, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Well, they do call it bad boys, but I think it's the ladies' turn. If you had a chance to check out L.A.'s Finest on Fox, airs every Monday at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And these guys have so many titles on this show. I am not. I think we'd be here all day if I announced them all. So let's just call them the creators of L.A.'s Finest. It's Brandon Margolis and Brandon Saunier. Gentlemen, how you doing? Outstanding. Yeah, we're doing good, James. Thanks for having us. Thank you for coming on. Now, we've already seen the first episode, and a lot of fans have seen it as well. I saw the response on social media myself. So what do you guys think? What was the response like from fans seeing the show for the first time? It was awesome. Honestly, we got a a real thrill going on Twitter and just engaging with the fans, talking about the show as it aired. You know, we were there for the East Coast feed and the West Coast feed, and people really seemed excited about it. Yeah, just watching, watching Twitter blow up, watching everybody talking about each moment of the show as it happened was an amazing experience. Just check, feeling it for the first time through the audience at the same time as them, could it doesn't get better than that. Gotta love that. Now, I really do love the dynamic between Sid and Nancy. It's, it's just so amazing. So what do you think makes them the perfect partners? The fact that they have a singular goal. They want to be good police officers while being opposite people. They come at every problem from different perspectives, which gives them the ability to talk through problems and, and solve things, but also makes that great dynamic for all of the fun banter and, and just looking at every situation in life from complete opposite angles gives us all of that dynamic back and forth and, and uh, really just is where the comedy and drama both come from. Yeah, and it's fun for us. You know, we're a writing team, so we spend basically, you know, more time with each other than we do with our own wives and families. So we, we're well aware that sometimes proximity to, to, to the same person all the time can lead to some tension. So it's a lot of fun to sort of exercise that tension with some humor and you know Sid and McKenna are just you know basically proxies for Brandon and I sometimes when we're arguing in the office I love that I love that now I think you guys did a really good job by the way in the first episode of giving fans of the Bad Boys franchise a couple of easter eggs here and there but not overdoing it so will we see more of that in future episodes and did you really feel like you had to pick your moments of when you wanted to work those in absolutely absolutely so look first and foremost Brandon and I are Bad Boys fans. You know, when when the opportunity to make a show in the Bad Boys universe came up, we jumped at it. It took all of 15 minutes for us to look at each other and say, like, all right, here's what the show's going to be. It's one person is this and the other person is that. And, and remember Will from the movie? All right, it's like this. And remember Martin? It's like that. We just love the universe so much that the show is full of Easter eggs just because we're fans, because, it, you know, more than just paying homage to something we love, we want to make sure that the fans understand that we live in the same world as, as the bad boys movies. In, in terms of not over overdoing it, you know, we want to remind people that this show was first developed two years ago. So that was when bad boys three still hadn't come out yet. Right. So Brandon and I were constantly checking with Sony and with Jerry Bruckheimer television about like, okay, can we see a script? Cause we don't want to poach anything that the movie's trying to do, but we want to lean into stuff. So we, we really, we're digging around for, you know, how many references can we make and how, how much overlap can we have? And I think the personally, the most exciting, technically it's an Easter egg, but the fact that we got to, to bring John Sally on board as Fletcher 
was such a thrill because she's such a hilarious part of the first two movies and we're such fans of, of John. So it was so cool when we found out that we had an opportunity to work with him. That was definitely one of my favorites, too. Now, speaking of your cast, outside of the amazing Gabrielle Union and Jessica Alba, of course, are, are, are great. You also have a great supporting cast outside of them as well. So outside of those two, since you guys wrote the pilot episode and several episodes this season, who's your favorite character to write or cast member to work with? Well, it's it's easy for me to point to my favorite character to write because I, I, people may not realize this, but we put ourselves on the show. What, what started as a joke, hey, what if, what if their partners are just two guys that are just like us? became us writing the Bends, we, we are commonly known as the Brandons, onto the show. So, so one of them's black, one of them's white, one of them's the family guy, one of them starting his family. You know, this is where we were when we were, were, were conceiving the show. And, and obviously, I get to be Ben Baines all day long. We're, we're shouting Ben's lines back and forth at each other. And, and then outside of that, we get to make fun of ourselves because <laughs> – I don't know how it happened, but we decided that the thing to do is have Gabrielle and Jessica constantly making fun of the Ben. So we get to we get to write all all of the insults we can think of toward one another get to fly onto the page. It it worked out perfectly. Uh, yeah, the, there's a scene in the pilot where uh, McKenna refers to them as Black Man and Robin, and when we yeah. were shooting that on the day, Jessica was was very happy to give as many alts as we could think of. And we ultimately went with that joke um, for the pilot. But we are happy to say that there are dozens of nicknames for the Benz that will make their way through in, in series. But rather than say, you know, Walker was my favorite to write for, I do want to talk about getting there to work with Ernie Hudson because that's a dream come true for us. He is literally the nicest human being ever. And when we were trying to uh, establish a personal life for Sid that was outside of the franchise, um, we thought it'd be really interesting to meet one of her parents and to sort of see where she came from. And we had, the films had referenced mom, but dad was sort of a, a clean slate. So we sat down and thought, wouldn't it be great to have um, Sid's father as a character on this show? And uh, when we found out Ernie Hudson was, was available and interested, we, we jumped at the chance because he, he, he's, we're such fans of his and he truly is a wonderful human being. Speaking of Easter eggs and homage, Somewhere down the line in season one, everybody should look out for a big Ghostbusters Easter egg. Oh, I was hoping for that. I was hoping for that. Looking forward to that <laughs> one for sure. For sure. We're talking to the Brandons, who, of course, are the creators of L.A.'s Finest, which you can watch every Monday night at 8 o'clock on Fox. Gentlemen, we saw a big reveal about McKenna's past in this week's episode. So how, do you, how could that affect her relationship? Of course, no spoilers here. How could that affect her relationship with Sid, but also her family dynamic going forward? Yeah, you know, so, the, if, if you're watching the end of the pilot, there was a big reveal about something from uh, McKenna's past. And, you know, the thing about it is, is we always believe that in a, in a good pilot, you establish your world, you establish your characters, and then you find a way to, to turn everything upside down. And, and that's what we tried to do. And, and that blast from the past, it, in fact, does turn everything in our character's world upside down. And as, you know, partners um, in work and, and whether it's, you know, a business relationship or a marriage, you know, secrets can only stay hidden for so long. And we loved in the pilot putting Sid's secret pass with McKenna's secret pass on a collision course. And there will be a ripple coming. So you talked about Ernie Hudson a couple minutes ago, and obviously we're digging into Sid's past here as well, not just dealing with her strange father, but also with what happened to her with Knox as well, which we saw in the pilot episode. Do you think her actions are driven by all of those things, or is she just is that just who she is? You know, I think for Sid, there's definitely, trauma is definitely a big part of her backstory. You know, having been uh, hurt the way she was and suffering the losses that she articulates in the pilot, um, you know, that's, those are the kinds of wounds that can stay with a person. And trauma is interesting because it colors your actions in so many ways that you don't necessarily understand, even when it's happening to you, the things that can trigger those wounds can force you to do things that you wouldn't do if you weren't so emotionally um, affected. So, you know, Sid, at the end of the day, is a very good cop. She was an excellent DEA agent. And 
you know, when she left the DEA to pursue Knox and join the LAPD, believing that's where he went, you know, she still is a driven off police officer. But we do want to explore, you know, what happened to her because so much of Sydney's character in the film was left, you know, unexplored. And that was something that Gabrielle was really interested in in this series was finding out what makes Sid tick and learning the things about her life that we never got the chance to explore in the films. Okay, so Mr. Margolis, I'm going to put the spotlight on you here for a second because you tweeted something last night sure, about Gabrielle Union shooting herself in the butt filming one of the scenes from the pilot. And I'm afraid <laughs> we're going to need a little bit more of a story behind that. So we were shooting um, the hostage exchange and it's set at the Santa Monica Pier. We actually shot that day in Venice Beach. And it was awesome because, you know, this is a big Sony production. It was a huge pilot. Our director, uh, Anton Cropper, had, you know, this incredible action sequence choreographed and we were, you know, we'd done the rehearsals and everything and we were ready to go. And I believe it was the first take when we were shooting the scene where um, the moment where Sid sees uh, a henchman creeping up on the kennel with a knife and she has to reach for her weapon and announce herself. And on the very first take, I guess Gab grabbed the gun and the trigger uh, and uh, it was still holstered, if you will. It was actually tucked into her uh, waistband and there was a loud pop from the, you know, the airsoft that we were using and a very guilty look on Gab's face. <laughs> and it was a hilarious moment on set. I love it. I love it. But that is to say that they do their own stunts as much as they possibly can. So, you know, that's an upside of that. Definitely. Definitely an upside Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. So, I, actually, I mean, it seems like you guys are using a lot of practical effects on the show. How was that to manage, especially with some of the big wow moments that you had? And how important was it for you to both have that kind of authenticity on the show? You know, we, we believe that if you do it, for real or as close to real as you can in front of a camera, it, it is always going to feel better than if you color it in it digitally later. So one, one of the, the mantras that we live by on our production is orange flame. Uh, and that is to say that I have always found it very, very difficult to replicate orange flames digitally on a screen. But if you do it for real, they're the right color orange and they, they, really knock your socks off. Mm -hmm. So so we strive as much as we possibly can for orange flames on LA Finest. And I will add to that, you know, we are in the Jerry Bruckheimer universe and it was important for us as much as we love the, the TV shows that Jerry Bruckheimer produces, you know, we're from the bad boys world. So we wanted the show to have as much of a cinematic feel as we could possibly manage with our budget and our constraints. And um, again, Anton Cropper and our crew do an amazing job setting that look, and um, we're really proud of how it comes across. Now, gentlemen, before I let you go, there are a lot of secrets floating around already, even after the No Secrets Pact that we saw. So without spoiling anything, how real are things about to get in episode two? Things are about to get very real. Like we said, you know, secrets can only be kept for so long in any relationship, especially when one member of that relationship uh lights a nightclub on fire that may have belonged to the other person right someone from their past so uh there will be a reckoning and it's only going to be contained for so long so we're looking forward to uh, the audience getting to see what happens when sid and mckenna both realize that they may have just lied to each other about no more secrets and we, we have a lot to explore so we get deep fast we we dive in we hit the ground running and we really just never look back. So, you know, we, we started with a bang, and then the, the very next episode does not slow down. Well, I can tell you guys right now that if, if you've watched episode one and loved it and think you're ready for episode two, you're totally not. You're not ready. There's so much stuff that's going to be coming at you in episode two. So don't miss it. Monday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time. It's LA's Finest on Fox. Matter of fact, you can watch it again. Watch episode one again right before that on the Fox app as well. It's the Brandons, Brandon Margolis and Brandon Sonier. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Uh, thanks for having us. Hey, our pleasure. Thank you. Hey, this is Jeff Lemire, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Whether the pages are in your hand or on your laptop, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're reading on, it's time for what we're reading and kind of out of the pages of Empire, the aftermath of it anyway, comes Immortal Hulk, 
number one immortal she-hulk i should say from marvel al ewing doing the writing on this one john davis hunt on the art marcio menyes on the colors vc's Corey pettit on the letters and then we have a trio on the cover it's joe burnett rui jose and paul mounts doing that one now again spoilers for anybody that has been following the she-hulk character jennifer walters back from the dead Yet again, after what the Kotati did to her in the pages of Empire. So that's why I kind of say out of the pages of Empire. Now, the story kind of starts off with her trying to reconcile. Spoilers, by the way, just in case, you know, you're wondering. Spoilers for this book specifically, not necessarily Empire. So for this book specifically, since it's been out for a few days. So basically, she's trying to reconcile returning from the dead. She actually ends up talking to Wolverine about it, of all people. It kind of shows up. In the beginning of the story. Now, Logan's not exactly the kind of person that's an open book that, you know, you can really talk to about almost anything. But it actually does kind of help her in a way. Then she ends up later on in the book. This actually deals with each one of her deaths, which is interesting. So she ends up seeking help from an Avenger later on who kind of puts everything into a different perspective. Maybe immortality isn't really that after all, and this person would have a very unique perspective on that. I won't spoil who that is, just in case you're not reading their solo series. So in between, kind of, we see Jennifer end up in this really creepy place that looks like hell, but it isn't. There's also a familiar face that waits for her in there, not just once, but twice. And I won't make, I won't tell you who that is, but it definitely ops the creep factor in this so it's like is it hell is it not there's they actually do a good job in this issue of explaining exactly what it is and how she how is it she ends up not being stuck there so that that much i can tell you so this could actually be the key to her either immortality or it could be a trap you, you don't really know for sure in this but it really does explore all of her deaths and when it talks about the final one that she dealt with in empire there's a nice little twist that leads us to the end of this book that might, I mean, it's not going to help her mental state. That that much I can tell you for sure. This is definitely going to put the pressure on her. And what happens beyond this is really, really going to change things, I think, in the, in the long term for Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk. Now, it also creates an interestingly layered villain problem. In this book as well that she has to deal with or not. That's just the thing. I mean, is this something she's going to have to deal with head on or not? Is this more a mental issue or a physical issue? So this this book really goes a few different directions. The art, too, by the way, is incredible in this thing. Very, very clean lines. The very, very good pops of color. I mean, you know, the, the, the cover is good, too. But the interior art, I think, actually steals the show in this thing for sure so it's a very interesting story that i can't wait to see what the next step is because this sets the table very well for what the story is going to be long term and i think and this makes me interested in a character that i wasn't always interested in before and one of the reasons i decided to to pick up this book in the first place is i was like oh well we've got the she hulk series Coming up, maybe I should read a little bit more She-Hulk. And I decided to pick this one up, especially after what happened in Empire as well. I wanted to know more about the character. So a couple different things made me pick this up. And I definitely think you should as well. Very worth your time. Very interesting concept and story that I think you'd enjoy diving into. Speaking of which, Boom Studios has been doing some really neat stuff lately as well. So how about we check out An Unkindness of Ravens, number one, from Boom and Dan Panosian. Panosian, or however you pronounce that, you know I'm terrible with names. The writer, cover artist for this book, and the creator of the story, by the way, Mariana Ignazi on the illustrations, Fabiana Mascolo on the colors, and Mike Fiorentino on the letters. There's also some art done by Dan Panosian in this as well for a house for an Abigail house thing that's in the beginning. That's really, really good, but I'll get to that. In a second. Spoilers for this book as well since it's already been out for a few days. So we're going to do a little bit of spoiler talk on this one too. So it's actually based in a New England town called Crab's Eye. Which really seems to have an interesting history with the witch trials. And that's part of the Abigail House story that happens in the beginning of this book that really sets the table. Now we meet Wilma who's kind of just moved to Crab's Eye. Her father's from there. She moved there with her father. 
and it's the first day at her new school. Now, it's interesting because the second she walks in, the first thing she sees is that she bears a striking resemblance to a girl that has gone missing at the school, and you would think, yes, that kind of drawing a lot of attention to her, probably unwanted attention when it's your first day. She actually gets a mysterious invitation, though, pretty soon after that, and later receives yet another invite from two very, very vastly different groups. Basically, she's already caught up in some sort of high school drama turf war. Actually, might be more than that, but we're in the very beginning stages of finding out just who these two groups are. Now, it's not completely clear what either side wants from her, but we do get to see an interesting secret from one of them, and that is the side of the Ravens themselves. So you've got like the Ravens and the Mean Girls who are led by this girl named Scarlet, which is weird. But we get an idea of who the Ravens are. Scarlet, though, and her friends are wild cards. They have no idea what their motives are. Her daddy's kind of like, almost like built the town, right? So the dad's the big shot in the town. So she's getting a little bit of a chip on her shoulder because of that. But it's not really clear what her interest is in Wilma, who kind of just got there, right? There's, so there's clearly something about Wilma that everybody seems to see but Wilma. That's, but that's sometimes how it can kind of go, right? So that's the, that's the very intriguing part about the story. Like, what is it about Wilma? And was it, what is it about these two factions? So that's kind of where we're at with this right now. And then all of a sudden you've got the mystery of that disappearance that we still have to figure out too. The Abigail House pages at the beginning of this book are not only crucial, it's not just a prologue, it's crucial to what's going to happen in the story that follows it, and it's just so haunting, and it just sets things up so, so well. The art style is completely different, so it really separates itself. I love the the, the art in the main story too, but the, man, that beginning thing, just it gave me like, it's almost like something you'd see in a Cullen Bunn story which is so creepy eerie i loved how that really set things up and, and but not in a like a scary way it was just an eerie vibe that i really really thought was neat so these characters are very interesting and i think that this book really has something going for it in a genre that doesn't have a whole lot of different in it this book seems to find a little bit of a niche to carve out of its own so i'm really interested to see where this is going. So if you think this is like almost like a Sabrina type thing, it's really not. It's kind of, it kind of sits in a land all of its own. But if you dig Sabrina, the the teenage witch, I think you would dig this for sure in in a completely different way. So yeah, throw this one in the poll box for me as well. A couple of really good ones this week that you should really check out. That's going to do it for what we're reading up next. Yeah, there's a ton of nerd news, so we better not waste any more time. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is David Harewood from Superdog. Now you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Starting things off with some not-so-super news. It is time for nerd news, and I say that because of the reports this week that Supergirl is going to be ending on the CW after six seasons. Now, before I go on, I want to make that very clear. Ending after six seasons. There were I've seen headlines saying the show was canceled, things like that. Not canceled ending huge difference that we need to start making sure we differentiate here that 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 kind of needed to be said but basically yes Supergirl will be ending after this upcoming sixth season and there's been a lot of different reactions to this and I can understand that but at the same time my first reaction to this was I wasn't surprised and I'll tell you why it has nothing to do with Superman and Lois, first of all. I think that that's a, that's a lazy argument. And they're not getting rid of Supergirl just because of Superman and Lois. These two shows could have easily, easily existed. They don't, even, they don't even exist in the same city, so it's not like you couldn't have done both at the same time. But, but the reason I wasn't surprised was, was that, to me, it felt like they were coming towards the end of their story anyway. And that's not necessarily, and that's not a bad thing either, by the way. I think that any show wants to be able to tell its story and then end naturally, right? You don't want to just keep going just to keep going. That's one of the reasons I think that fans of The Walking Dead have kind of, you know, drifted away from the show a little bit. It feels like that, even though there's many comics and you could argue stories still left to be told there, 
they just, you know, that's a show that probably should have ended a while ago and didn't. And here they are, you know, ending after 11 seasons and things feel stale. Whereas with Supergirl, we're staring at a sixth season coming up and you argue, okay, well, where would they have left to go from here, right? There's still, I mean, other series that are in the Arrowverse still have plenty of rogues left to tackle. You can make that argument. But with Supergirl, I mean, once you introduce Lex Luthor and and some of the other rogues that they've had in past seasons, it's like, okay, well, after this season, where would you go anyway? So basically, one of the only storylines we need to have sewn up here is that, well, one of the only ones, but the major one for me is, is that Kara finding a way to be Kara Danvers and Supergirl and be okay. That is the major storyline that they still need to figure out on the show. Once they do that, they can ride off into the sunset and be fine, I think. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that Supergirl would never show up in the Arrowverse again. It's not like the show would end and then we'd never see her again. She could certainly pop up on basically any show, really, or during crossovers and stuff like that. It's not like this could be goodbye forever. It's just goodbye to this series. Now, for some characters, it's going to be goodbye forever. But... You've had, you've, we've had characters move on in the show already. You know, Wynn has moved on. We've seen James Olsen move on in the show. It feels like Alex is going to be close to moving on as well, just as she makes a transition into her life. It just seems like there's a lot of moving on here. And there are characters that, you know, maybe haven't gotten a chance to to show what they truly are, like Dreamer is, a, is an example. Maybe Dreamer is a character that that benefits from this the least because we don't know that that character will go on in another series. But Dreamer is a character that just seemed like they were just getting started and, and now that that character could be going away. But from the standpoint of Supergirl, their story has pretty much been told and to go on just for the sake of going on, that never works out for any series, I don't think. And, and quite frankly, you know, Melissa Benoist is ready to give her birth to her first child any time now and you know maybe Melissa herself just wants more time to spend with her new family and you heard Ruby Rose say it's one of the reasons that she left Batwoman that being the lead in a superhero series is a lot not just you know from you know from the perspective of having to deal with the fans that you know lose their minds over every little thing but and that's not their their words that's my words but I mean, there's a lot of shooting responsibilities. There's a lot of long hours, long days. You know, you got to be away from your family a lot. Maybe that's just something, and I'm not putting words in her mouth either, but maybe that's just something Melissa Benoist just doesn't want to do anymore. And quite frankly, she is Supergirl. That show doesn't go on without her, by the way. So it's not like she could leave the show like Ruby Rose did and they'd be fine. You can't have that show without her. And you can't recast Supergirl. It's just not possible. Okay, so let's just put that idea out of our minds right now. It just feels like time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't understand. I I mean, I get that people are sad. I'm sad, too. I'll miss the show. Don't get me wrong. I will miss this show. No doubt about it. But at the same time, I'd rather miss it than be talking about it in season eight or nine going, what are we doing? You know, what exactly are we still doing here? So I think that this is a great way to go. I mean, if, and if and I'm a big believer of it. Lucifer is the same way. Lucifer's ending after six seasons as well. And at some point, you just have to look and say, you know, do you trust the creative team of these series to just know when it's time to go? And if you've loved a show for this long, one of the reasons is because of those writers, because of those creators, because of those producers, directors, and so on. And if they say that this is the end of their story you got to kind of take them at their word if you've trusted them for this for this much time. So, I, again, I'm sad to see it go, too. But at the same time, I think that this could be a lot better of a thing than, than, we, might, than we might think about. Plus, we always have those six seasons to look back on as well. Speaking of the Arrowverse, the report has come out that, yes, we have filming resuming for a bunch of shows coming up soon. Some of them have already started, as a matter of fact. This, according to Deadline, who posted the story, you know, the Batwoman has already begun their, their season. They've already begun filming. We've touched on that here on the show and, and at down in nerdypodcast.com and on social media. Supergirl, surprisingly enough, will return to filming on September the 28th. That's Monday. You could They could already be working 
as of you hearing this, so depending on when you're listening to this podcast. So that's an interesting one, especially since Melissa Benoist, I don't know how she's going to be able to be a part of that production anytime soon. So I don't know. And that's another big question mark is where that season's going to go, if that's the case. The Flash looks like, and these are reports, by the way, nothing's been made official by Warner Brothers Television or anything like that or the CW. The Flash looks to return on October the 1st. Legends of Tomorrow, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, going to be back on October the 5th. Superman and Lois will be in mid-October, along with Titans, of course, with now moving to HBO Max. Stargirl is going to be beginning in October, at the end of October. And speaking of HBO Max, Doom Patrol going to start their new season shooting in January. Just a little bit of a side note, that's not the Arrowverse, but still, you know, something that would interest us, I think. And that's the Kung Fu reboot series that's going to be on the CW is also going to be starting shooting in mid-October. Obviously, they've had plenty of time to plan for contingencies. Lucifer has gone. Speaking of Lucifer, they got back filming not too long ago. And, and it's Vancouver, so I mean, it's a different different location. So a different set of rules and things like that. But, it, you know, at some point, you know, you have to at least give it a shot, right? That's, that's the thing that, and I mean, health and safety obviously paramount and that is that goes with anything i've said this on the show before when movies started back filming again health health and safety is always going to be at a premium right now while the coronavirus is still running rampant right so health and safety all these protocols are in place you've got you know the 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 sag aftra has their protocols that they that they expect productions to follow and things like that this has all been worked out so yeah it's going to cost more money no doubt about it but at the same time, you have to actually try to see if you can make this work, right? At some point, you have to get cameras rolling again and see how it goes. Because, you know, while we've had some very high-profile positive tests, the, the Batman being the prime example for their production down over there in Europe, the, you have to at least give it an opportunity to see how you're going to go. Because think about it, Carnival Row was able to pull it off with their production, and they were able to finish. Again, that was in Europe, but still, they were able to get things done, and they and they came out of it healthy, if, as far as I saw, anyway. I didn't see any positive tests pop up from that report. So, I mean, at some point, you have to see if you're going to be able to get this off the ground. And, and if you know if you have to hit the pause button or, or it just doesn't work out, then at least you made the effort sort of thing, right? So you have to see at some point whether or not you're going to be able to resume filming in these conditions. And it's not stopping shows from being announced either, and new stuff from being announced. So obviously the plan was to get back filming at some point. If you start filming now, I think it'll be a breeze to get things up and going as far as premieres go in January. And think about this. You could be looking at most of your season, or at least half your season, being filmed by then. Because I think that... With these seasons starting in January, I think we're kind of all operating under the assumption, and nobody's confirmed this yet as far as episode count is concerned, I think we're kind of operating under the assumption that we're not going to get full 20-plus episode seasons out of any of these shows this year. I think that in twenty, as far as filming in 2020 and releasing in 2021, I think we're going to see shortened seasons. That way we can get back to a regular schedule for the fall of 2021, and the shows will, will be back at their regular times at that point. So I think that that's the goal here is to get ultimately to get things back on the track that you were originally to get back to the actual normal, not the new normal. I think that that's the goal that they're going for. And by the way, I'm all for that. Let's please just get back to normal as quick as possible. Just in general, never mind television. Let's just get back to normal as quick as possible. So, and again, only time will tell, you know, if, when, how, that's even going to be able to happen, but until I mean, until you start getting on that set and trying to do this thing, you won't know for sure. So again, this is a only time will tell type of situation. I said that shows were still being announced, and they certainly were this week because HBO Max just announced a pretty big deal, and that is that a Peacemaker series is going to be coming to the streamer, and yes, Peacemaker from the Suicide Squad movie, and yes... John Cena is going to play the title role. James Gunn's going to write all the episodes and direct a bunch of them. And they brought our Peter Steffen, who is one of the producers on Suicide, the Suicide Squad as well, is going to be attached 
to this series. And this is a big deal because this is kind of one of the things that fans were, were, were looking at with DC and HBO Max. Well, you see Disney doing their series spun out of their movies on Disney+. Plus. So will DC start to do the same thing with HBO Max? We know that we already had one spinoff that everybody seems to be forgetting, right? Gotham City Central, that series that's going to be done by Matt Reeves, which is based in the Batman universe. And just because we don't know if anybody from the Batman is going to be in that series doesn't mean it's not still a tie-in to the movie in some way. And this Peacemaker series is going to be an origin story series too, by the way. So we're going to get to see the origins of Peacemaker in this series. I I mean, that, that kind of, you know, is a backtrack way of going about things too, is it not? So if you're going to give us prequel series or even stuff that follows up, a movie. I'm fine with that. I don't care how you do it. It's just nice to see that that effort is being made. And does that mean this is going to start happening across the board and everybody's going to get a spinoff and, you know, every movie is going to have a series? Of, no, that, that doesn't mean that. But you also have to have willing participants to make this happen. And, I, and, and money has to be a factor here as well, because you've got John Cena obviously had to be willing to do this series, right? And, and it'll likely be a limited series. There's, again, no chat about that. It's, it's going to be eight episodes. But this will likely be a limited series, right? I don't expect this to be something that's going to run multiple seasons. But, of course, you know, if it's really successful and, and everything's right, maybe there's something that they would try to continue in some way. But, I, I mean, you, you have to have actors and, and creative people that are willing to do these series and not, for the lack of a better way of putting it, Want, wanting a boatload of money because there's no way that that I just don't see like Ben Affleck doing a Batman series on HBO Max. It just wouldn't happen. And, and that's no knock on Ben Affleck, by the way, either. But, you know, there's scheduling issues and, you know, and, you know, certain you're, you're expected to be paid a certain amount for certain things. And maybe something's not really worth it for you if it's not not as much money and, and the time commit, commitment that's involved. I get that. But you have to have willing participants, and I think that the excitement level around the Suicide Squad and the way that everybody just seemed to get along really well also helped things along. But you also have to have people like John Cena and James Gunn and company that are willing to take on a project like this, even though you know it's not the big budget movie dollars that you're probably going to be seeing. So I, I commend them for that. And hey, I do hope that we get more of these, but I don't want them for the sake of getting them, right? Give me ones that make sense. And obviously they see something in this Peacemaker character that they think that not only fans are going to love, but a story that is worthwhile telling. So again, I trust James Gunn and everybody involved here. We'll have to see how this goes. Speaking of series based out of movies, yeah, let's talk about that WandaVision trailer, right? Because that thing has been, it's a really, really funky trailer. But I like the vibe that's created here too. And, you know, at first it was like, well, is this based somewhat on the Tom King Vision series. And I guess aesthetically, you could say that, but I don't think that, that story-wise, that's exactly what they're going to be going for here. So I think that that is something that's that this trailer showed us, and the fact that it's just, again, it's just freaking weird in, in a way, but weird in such a good way at the same time. It's like, it's weird, and it's almost like in a... You know, it's almost like, are they trapped in an alternate alternate timeline sort of thing? Or is it something that's going on? Does it have something to do with Katherine Hahn's character, which we now know, or at least it seems like we know, that she's going to be playing Agatha Harkness in the series, who is a powerful witch, and does she have something to do with that? But to me, it's like when, when, when that character turns to Vision at one point in the trailer and says, you're, it says something along the lines of, you're dead, don't you know that sort of thing? And you kind of see this look on his face like, huh. Like he just had this realization that he didn't know before. Like suddenly his memory, you know, his memory was scrubbed before. But now it's like everything is clear. And could this whole thing, by the way, be a coping mechanism for Wanda Maximoff? Could it be a coping mechanism for Scarlet Witch? You saw how upset she was, and rightfully so, in Avengers Endgame. Right? So could this partially be her way of dealing with with what's happening. I'm not even saying consciously. It could be subconsciously. There's There could be so many layers to this series that it's not even funny. And we know that it's going to be the first 
Marvel series from Disney Plus now moving up ahead of the Falcon and Winter Soldier. So, I don't know. I just love how wonderfully weird this trailer looks and how interesting it looks. And I, and I love the 50s vibe too as well. I don't know how long that's actually going to last in the series. I love how they snuck the co- the classic costumes in there and it actually looks like it's going to be a Halloween type deal, which I think is funny. But here's the one tiny thing that I worry about. I do worry that it's going to be weird for the sake of being weird. And and that's always something that you got to be really careful of because I feel like Legion drifted into that territory at some point as much as I know some fans loved Legion. It seemed like that's a series that sort of drifted into weird for the sake of being weird type of thing. So I'm just worried that it's going to be something that goes outside of itself just because of, you know, to, to be different sort of thing. So I don't know. I'm just, I, I am curious. I am concerned, but at the same time, it looks cool. It looks different, but I hope not, you know, again, not different and weird for the sake of being weird, but again, only time will tell. And I think we've all been looking forward to some, some, one of these series, just get, get one of them out there and see what we've got. And it's almost like too. You have to wonder. Okay, okay. What's the what's the aftermath of this? What is the what, how does this further the overall story? And I guess that'll be a part of what we're looking forward to. So we'll find out. Still no release date on this. Keep you posted on that. Speaking of Marvel, really quickly, let's run through some of these movie delays, shall we? And I'm not going to get on my high horse about this. I promise. I'm just going to give you the delays. Starting with Black Widow, moving from November now to May seventh of 2021. So at least they pushed it into the far future giving themselves a chance to actually get this in a theater that has more than five people in it. That's also going to delay Shang-Chi, by the way, which now is going to come out July 9th of 2021, which I actually think is a better date for that movie anyway, get it right in the heart of summer. And Eternals is going to move from November 5th, 2021 now to, actually it's going to move to November 5th of 2021, excuse me. So all of a sudden, Immortals just keeps getting violently shut. I mean, Eternals keeps getting violently shoved deeper and deeper down the schedule. Also means there's going to be no Marvel movies this year by my count. Not not MCU movies anyway, not Marvel Studios. And I think that's right, isn't it? I mean, let's look, I mean, if you look at the calendar, I don't remember one coming out this year. So that's going to be weird, but at the same time is it could you could also make the argument that after Endgame, you need that deep breath, right? You needed to let it breathe a little bit and you know, make the people miss you. And I think we are. We're missing the Marvel movies. And that might actually turn bigger profits if theaters are allowed to open at or near capacity once these movies do finally see the light of day. You know, finally getting to see a Marvel movie again. So, I mean, again, this is something that I don't even think this is a gamble to pay off. I just think this is Walt Disney's way and Marvel's way of saying, you know what, this ain't happening anytime soon. So let's just push it that push it way further, far down the line and hope for the best. Of course, that also means you're going to be cramming a bunch of movies. I think that now there's going to be four Marvel movies in 2021, if I'm remembering that correctly. So, and, and, and again, we don't know what the situation is going to look like in May of 2021 or July or June or, you know, who knows. So until we get to a point where things start going back to normal, there's just there's there's the door is always going to be open and it's going to be hard to forecast what's going to happen. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Once again, I want to thank the Brandons for joining me this week. Brandon Margolis and Brandon Sonier talking about LA's finest. Make sure you're watching it Monday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern Time and again on the Fox Now app. Also, make sure you're following us online at downandnerdypodcast.com, on social media at downandnerdy757, on Twitter and on Instagram, and at downandnerdy on Facebook. By the way, you can now listen to us On Amazon Alexa device through Amazon Music and Audible, you can just ask, you know, your smart speaker, ask Alexa to play the Down and Nerdy podcast. And then, I mean, that's just one more way that you can listen to and subscribe to the show if you want to go ahead and try that out. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly. Be good to your fellow nerds.